It's so good to be here, to come from the hustle and bustle of our communities and our travels and to take a deep breath and say, wow, uh, here we have a chance to be together and to share and to learn and to share what we know and to get our spirits filled. It's like a gasoline tank that's going to get all filled up. But we, the theme of this conference this, this time is innovate. But you know, um, it's really important to think about what's going on in our communities and where we're at. And in many of our communities, we're in a state of emergency. Emergency because of the senseless violence in our streets. Eight youth have been shot and killed in my small west side Chicago community one last week. Emergency because 14 million Americans are unemployed. Emergency because one in four American children under the age of six are living below the poverty line and poverty is growing at an alarming rate. Emergency because our public schools are failing. Inner city schools with only 50% graduation rates and kids who do graduate and without the reading and math skills they need to make it in today's marketplace. Emergency because parents are going to jail because they falsified their address so they could send their kids to a better school. Emergency because we're spending so much money and lives on unproductive wars and we're cutting preschool programs and college scholarships. Emergency because much of the U.S. doesn't know or care that we're in a state of emergency in our under-resourced communities. It is precisely at this moment, it is for such a time that God has called us as God's yeah. people to say, uh-uh, we ain't gonna let that stay. We ain't gonna let that happen. And we are called to try and figure out how to, in new ways, how to make a difference in our neighborhoods, productive ways, and that's why we need innovation. In my neighborhood on the west side of Chicago, Many of the systems of society don't work very well, and probably don't in yours either. The schools are failing. The financial system doesn't work for folks in my neighborhood. The justice system, the police system doesn't work very well. They are broken. And it's because they don't work well, because they don't work well, we have the freedom to try and do things differently because they hold promise of, of things that can be better. We have a new freedom in the midst of this failure, in the midst of this brokenness, we have a freedom to do things better. So what do we got to lose? When things aren't working and practices are broken, it's just such a time that you and I as Christians are called to do something different, something new, something that holds promise of being better than what is. And that's exactly what happened to us at Bethel. We were sitting around a conference table uh, bemoaning the fact that the, the p failure of the public schools in our community and trying to figure out what to do. A colleague asked us, what do you want in place of what you don't want? Let me tell you that some of the folks on the Occupy Wall Street would be really uh, helped out if they could answer that question of what they want in place of what they don't want. And maybe that's one of the tasks we have because we have God's spirit of hope and possibilities in us. And maybe we have the possibility of figuring out what we want in place of what we don't want. But that question freed us up to, to put together a school for dropouts that did things differently, that taught math ratios by shooting craps got kids to read, to choose, when they could choose the books they wanted to read, even though they weren't on the good literature list. When they, we could work together for alternative futures. The results, 65% of the former dropouts continued on into higher education. It isn't the kids that are dumb. Amen. And you know, we couldn't stop with having a model or having a, a chance to do that. We had to then to begin to work, how do we infuse this into the public school system? How do we begin to push for the kinds of change that really needs to happen? We can't stop with our models. We can't stop with our experiments. We have to then push to change the system so that every child has the opportunity for a decent and, and successful education. 
Well, 35 years later, that second chance school is still operating. And um, it is still there as a second chance for the young people that uh, the system doesn't work for. In the fierce urgency of now, we don't have the luxury to sit around and complain or to just keep doing things the same old broken ways. We have to ask, why are we doing it this way? Is it working? And that reminds me of the story of a little girl who was washing, watching her mother prepare for a big uh, family gathering, and she cut the ham, this large ham, she cut it in half and put it in two pans uh, in the oven. She said, Mom, why are you doing that? And mother said, well, I don't know, but that's the way my mother always did it. And so the little girl went and asked her grandma, Grandma, why do you do that that way? And the grandma said, oh, child, my ham was just too big for my little oven, so I had to cut the ham in half to fit in the oven. How many of the ways we do things in our organizations, in our churches, in our communities, we do because that's the way it's always been done? We need to ask that question, why are we doing it? And that's why we need you young people to raise those questions. Why are you doing it that way? Isn't there a better way? Or what for? Why are we doing this? And we have the opportunity to expect some different results. It's exciting and hopeful to see uh, the great things that many groups are doing, and that's what's so wonderful about this conference and these workshops. You're going to have the chance to share what you're doing, the good things you're doing, the innovative things you're doing, but you're going to have a chance to listen uh, to others and hear what's going on. So we have an opportunity as God's people to create new ways of enabling jobs that clean the environment, of developing alternative financial institutions, and to work for community and depositors, uh, and develop mechanisms such as land trusts and credit unions and other kinds of new financial uh, institutions that really help make a difference. And we who have a set of values, uh, of people first, of of caring for our neighbors, of the common good. We who have this set of values, we have a chance to think in economic terms, how do we infuse those values uh, into the way things work in our society? And so we have a special calling and a special mission. Well, you know, it was in the prophet Isaiah's time that there was a lot of corruption, uh, abuse of power, uh, neglect of widows and immigrants, and there was violence much like in our times. And Isaiah was angry at the injustice and angry at the powers that would be. In the face of that, God's word for the people through Isaiah is so startling and so hopeful. Forget about what's happening. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do a new thing. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. Wow, can't you see it? God's given us this gift of new vision uh, to look at our neighborhoods and to see what could happen. We had that experience at Bethel when we were given the opportunity to buy a closed down inner city hospital in our community. And when we did, the headline in the newspaper was, it'll take a miracle. It took new eyes to see the possibilities in those shuttered buildings in the campus. It took willingness to risk a vision of new things, persistence, innovation, $30 million and 10 years to create subsidized elderly housing, children's daycare, a health center, cultural and performing arts center, Bethel New Life's offices, a community within the community, a place of people coming together. Adaptive reuse, it's called, a new thing. So innovation means trying new things, doing better. But we will not always succeed. And we have to be willing to risk. We have to be willing to fail. And I could tell you all the things that we at Bethel have failed at uh, in our time together. But God's promised us to hang with us, to give us courage and persistence to keep trying even when things don't seem to be working out. It is for such a time as this, and you and I are called to innovate. We are called, not, we are called to, to innovation and to be fearless because the way things are are not acceptable to the people in our community and to our communities. We have to ask the questions. We need to move into asking, willing to risk. We need to innovate. 
inspired by God's vision for our communities, armed with courage and God's promise to be with us. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do a brand new thing. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert. Rivers in the Badlands, God's promise. Now we have to put it into action. Amen. 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 Some are gifted as innovators, and many of us don't think of our, ourselves that way. But these days, every person is challenged to innovate. And that's one reason why CCDA made the conference theme this year, of all years, innovation. Now, you've followed God's call to help transform your community. You've done your best to develop programs around the problems. But what does incarnational love demand when the realities that shape your community have shifted? You know, I think about this image that I, I saw Brian McLaren first showed me. There was a giant hurricane, I think in Honduras, and the, and the storm was so big that there was a bridge over a river and the river shifted. And if you see an aerial photo, you now see a bridge over nothing because the river's here. That's happened to some of us. We've made commitments, you've incarnated, you've moved in, and everything is turned over again and shifted right under you. Changing realities call for fresh approaches. So at CCDA 2011, we brought together cutting edge thinkers and practitioners to reconsider the way we do Christian community development, how we engage society, how we develop our neighborhoods, and how we confront our latest advocacy challenge which is educational reform. Now, one big reason we have to innovate this year is sustainability. Sustainability for organizations, sustainability for families, sustainability for individuals. Budgets have been cut, government funding is down, private funding is down, individual donors are pinched. So one of CCDA's responses this year to this need is the business's ministry track. With this track, we affirm that business is an outstanding Christian calling. People are called to many different things. Some to teach, some to pastor, some are called to business. We don't say that enough. Sometimes we don't say it at all. But it's a gifting and a call as any other gifting and call. And this year, we're gonna call that out, that business is an outstanding calling. You may be called to business. Don't hide it, don't be ashamed of it, give it to God. As any person called to anything has to give that calling back to God. So the Businesses Ministry Track this year specifically addresses poverty with a goal of job creation. Not just talking about poverty, not just wishing it, we're, let's, let's get some impacts. Let's focus on job creation. I want to mention some of these workshops to you. I invite you to connect with the people. That's why I'm bringing them up. Stanley Patton is senior pastor of Daybreak Family Worship Center and owner of Patton's Restaurant. And they say it's an award-winning restaurant there in Des Moines. And he's going to teach a workshop called Recession Intervention. Developing Businesses as Ministries. Jane Vanderplug is a Portland, Oregon business owner, and she's going to share on identifying common ground that can bridge business people to Christian community development. I don't think I'm the only person in the room. It was often hard for me to understand the business people and know how to think about them. What are they going to do in my ministry? Are they going to help? Are they gonna under what, are, what are these people doing? Jane has a passion for Christian community development, and she's a business owner. This is talking to, to an inside person. She's going to share from her heart and her experience about how we can do this. Amy Sherman is going to share practical details on business skills used for justice and shalom. I love that phrase. I'll just say business skills used for justice and shalom. Christopher Posey is going to teach on shifting towards sustainable economic development models. 
Brian Jenkins in Chicago, a number of us know him through Entrenuity. He's keeping going. They've got something called Starting Up Now, and it, among other things, it's an online tool for developing your business plan. And they, they're targeting a wide audience. I learned recently that there is a group of prisoners in Michigan who have been using this tool while they're in their transitional year out. They're not all gonna start businesses, but they think that this type of thinking can help make them more employable. So Brian's already having an impact with the tool, and I know you're, you're, I don't know where Brian is. I know your rollout's November 1st, and I'm sort of letting the cat out of the bag, but we need that tool right now. And with Brian, I allude to something else. We have amazing innovators in the area of business who are in our movement right now, in this room, who've been involved with CCDA for 22 years. One of them, Jim Reiner of Belay Ministries in Denver. They've been around for 17 years. They were launched out of Mile High Ministries. Now, they're an organization that creates businesses to employ and job train individuals who are rebuilding their lives from addiction, homelessness, and prison. They specifically address those needs through job creation. Now, their flagship business is called Bud's Warehouse. You mash together Home Depot and a thrift store, and what do you get? You get a home improvement thrift store. I just yanked that image off of their website, but you know what? They're good for it. Take down the phone number. Google them up. It's a home improvement thrift store. They have another shop right now. It's called Baby Bud's. It's children's clothing that's resold. Now, last year, Belay provided jobs and job training opportunities for 75 individuals. 75 people, that's a lot. That is not easy to do. That's an amazing achievement in my book. But they were looking at the need in their community, and they said, you know what, we've got to do more. And you know, we have these, exer these tools that we use in our strategic planning, the BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. So they said, what would be a big, hairy, audacious goal for our organization. They said, put a zero on it. From 75 to 750 jobs a year. Employment and job training for men and women rebuilding their lives from addiction, homelessness, and prison. And I said, Jim, how are you gonna do it? He said, we need partners, we need help, we need people to work with us. But they stepped out in faith and people are coming around them. You know that they were approached by the Denver City Jail. And the Denver City Jail says, we love your vision. We've been thinking about what we could do with our kitchen. Because, you know, we feed a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> they feed a lot of people. And yet there is downtime. That's right. It's a large commercial kitchen. And they're thinking, what can we do? And they were looking at that Homeboy Industries model in Los Angeles. And they said, what if we can use the downtime for baked goods and have a resale point inside? You know, get a lot of people going through the jail, but let's have a, a retail shop outside as well. And so they have not launched that. They're in the planning phase. They're gathering people around it. That's the kind of innovation we need. And so he's just one person, one person who's in our midst, who's in our body. Finally, I challenge you. You know, you know, sometimes in church we'll say, you know, greet somebody in a certain way. I challenge you to greet people. Give them your name, maybe where you're from. Ask them, what are you innovating? I don't want to, when people tell me to do stuff, I, something goes in my mind and I say, I'm not going to do that just because you, you're trying to make me do it. So I'm a contrarian, I'm not going to do that to you, I'll just say, consider it. <laughs> Greet each other that way. Brother, what are you innovating? Grandma Perkins, what are you innovating this year? Grandma Perkins Kitchen. Grandma Perkins Kitchen <laughs> this year in the game today. So you don't know who's next to you. You have no idea who's next to you. I'm excited to be here at CCDA. I'm excited for my beautiful wife, Coffee, 
and my four children to be right here. My son Samuel is 11 years old. He's a cancer survivor. He's a survivor, and he's right here. And I love that he's going to meet all of you. So, amen. Thank you so much, CCD18, for choosing innovation as our theme this year. Amen. And we should go.